Thank you for clicking on the video. This is the Dixie Cryptid Podcast, and my name is Cameron Buckner. All we do is tell stories here. Three stories in this podcast, and in between each story, I'm going to drop a recording that I got around a campfire last weekend from people who've actually experienced strange things in the woods, possibly Bigfoot. So we got three stories, two interviews. For, so there's actually five stories in this video. Hope you guys enjoy it. Come on, come on. Let's get this thing rolling, Cam. Shut your mouth and let the stories roll. All right, here we go. All right, this email, I don't know the gentleman's name. I'm assuming it's a gentleman. I just know his email address. So he is by default anonymous. Here's what he writes, Bigfoot story, it's really good. I've seen three Bigfoots in my life. The first, when I was four years old. I can't talk about it though without first talking about my dad. Dad didn't have more than a ninth grade education, but he joined the Air Force during the Korean conflict. That led to opportunities that placed him inside Cheyenne Mountain as one of the first programmers. He was a brilliant man who was respected in both his career and his community. He was my hero, and I was his shadow. Where he was, that's where I wanted to be, and what he did, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be just like him. He was born in Florida in the first year of the Great Depression. They lived so far out in the sticks, it was a four-mile walk into town. Even after they got a truck, the condition of those old sandy roads made travel so difficult it was still a four-mile drive, but it sure beat walking. Back in the 1960s, we lived in Wichita Falls, Texas, where Dad was stationed at Shepard Air Force Base as a flight electronics instructor. He and my mom ran a restaurant on the side, but his greatest joy was being outside hunting and fishing. Because he worked so much, he usually fished at night when everybody else was asleep. He loved catfish and had access to all the local ponds and lakes. And that's where I saw my first Bigfoot. One evening, Dad was closing down the restaurant when a buddy stopped in and asked if he wanted to go fishing. Of course, my dad said yes, and I begged to go. His buddy had a small 500-acre cattle ranch where he raised Brahma cattle. I love going out there. Somewhere, there's even a picture of me sitting on top of one of those big bulls. He made a quick stop at the house to pick up our fishing gear, my dad's 12-gauge Ithaca shotgun that he always had with him whenever he was outdoors, a few snacks, and my blanket. Well, I changed into my pajamas, and we headed to the ranch. And when we got there, Dad made my usual spot on the ground with my blanket and started a small fire to keep me warm and occupied. It was your typical ranch cattle pond built in a draw with an earthen dam. I laid there by the fire while Dad and his buddy fished. They had a few beers and they swapped stories. Suddenly, a group of about 20 cows bellowed below us and started running in our direction. Something had spooked them. A small herd of the one-ton Brahmas bellowed in the night as their thundering hooves shook the ground, and that's something that's not easy to forget. Terrified, all I wanted to do was crawl inside my dad's pocket. I was close to the truck, and he was ten feet away next to the bank of the river, and he ran over, and he scooped me up, and he put me in the pickup. Then he grabbed a shotgun and ordered me not to move. I remember peeking my head over the side of the bed and seeing the cattle run by. They were still bellowing and making all kinds of racket. And then I saw something a four-year-old will never forget. I had no idea what it was, but it was huge, bigger than the cattle. It was on two legs, and it was 10 to 15 feet behind them. I couldn't see every detail, but the moon must have been bright enough and the fire must have been big enough that I could see something. My father's buddy drew his sidearm and hollered at it with a whistle and a good cowboy shout. 
The creature stopped dead in its tracks 50 feet from us, and when it looked in our direction, I could see the eye shine. A few seconds later, he raised the pistol and fired a shot. The sound made me jump. Just as quickly, my dad raised his Ithaca and he fired three rounds. I can still close my eyes and see the fire explode from the barrel. All the while, both men were shouting something to the effect of, Get out of here! Get out of here! Y'all! It all happened within seconds, but even today, more than 50 years later, it replays in my mind in slow motion. The creature quickly bolted away, vanishing from my view in seconds. Both men now had their weapons leveled in that direction. Once they felt it was gone, they moved quickly to break camp. The reels were thrown into the back of the truck and the fire was doused, and I was scooped up and placed in the cab. But not a word was spoken. And when my dad dropped his buddy off at the ranch house, he said, You okay? The man replied with a nod and said, I hate those things. And they were the only words I remember either of them saying. Well, curiosity got the better of me on the ride home, and I finally got the nerve to speak. I was only four, and four-year-olds always have tons of questions. Daddy, what was that? I asked. Well, it's nothing you need to know about, son, he told me. Well, was it a man? It was Harry, I said, but there was no answer. My father was silent, intently staring at the road ahead. Dad, was it a hobo? I pressed. Hobos were still a thing back in the 1960s. No, son, that wasn't a hobo. It, it just wasn't. Well, what was it? And I wanted to know. My dad knew I wasn't going to give up. No four-year-olds give up on questions. He took a deep breath and said, Well, it's kind of a monkey, son, that lives in the woods. They're afraid of people. Well, at four, I didn't know monkeys lived in Texas. Things like that weren't on my radar, but if Dad said it was a monkey, it must have been a monkey. However, even at four, I recognized that my dad was afraid. Even then, I knew what guns were for, hunting and protection, and this wasn't a hunting trip. And then we left real quick, so I continued my questions. Well, Dad, why was it chasing the cows? Is it mean? Are they poisonous? Which woods does it live in? Well, my dad was used to my interrogations, and he would usually lovingly answer them in ways I could understand, but this time was different. He was silent, and after a few more minutes of nonstop questions, he pulled the truck over and looked at me with his piercing steel blue eyes. Son, here's the problem. For some reason, the government doesn't want people to know about this monkey. The government was well known in our house. I knew my dad worked for the government. The government owned things. When I was born, my sister asked if I belonged to the government or to my mom and dad. Well, we didn't know or understand exactly what the government was, but we knew it owned things and it had rules. My dad continued, Because I work for the government, I have to do as they ask, and since you're my son, so do you. You have to help keep this monkey quiet. You can't tell anyone. Do you understand? You can't even tell your mom. It's your job now to keep this a secret. You can ask me more questions later, but right now, you need to be quiet about it. Do you understand, son? Yes, sir, I will, I assured him, and I did. Until this year, I've never told anyone this story. First, I told my wife, then my son, and now I'm telling you. A few years later, during a trout fishing trip in the Colorado Rockies when I was nine, I brought it up again. And that was when my dad explained in detail the creature that he called a skunk ape. But that's a story for another time. Bro, you can't leave us hanging like that. I, <laughs> I've got his email. I'm going to shoot him an email back and I'm going to tell him. I'm going to jump on him. For letting us hang in like that, because here's a government worker. Here's a government. His father's a government worker, and he knows what these things are. And I, I would love to hear what his dad said. You're totally anonymous. Heck, I don't even know your name. Send me that story, bro. If you haven't already, I'll do a search for your email, and we'll see what we come up with. 
but I ran across this story and I wanted to get it out to you guys. So thanks to the writer, this was uh, very intriguing and very well written. Man, it's a great story and I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. All right, it was September of 2017. Mark and I had went to Lee Creek for an outing. We'd got there and we'd met Debbie and the girls and several other people. They'd talked about all the activity they'd had previously in this area. And we had cooked steaks and stuff, ate, went down to the creek and hung out there. And somebody started throwing rocks in the creek and we were getting rocks thrown back off the little bluff that was across the creek that didn't have any access by any roads or anything. That went on for probably an hour or so. It kind of dissipated after a while and we all walked back to camp. It probably was about 12.30 at that point. And Mark and I had camped away from everybody else in the main camp. We'd crossed the creek and went back in the woods probably 150, 200 yards from the creek on the other side away from everybody. We had a four-wheeler and we left the main camp because it was probably, distance-wise, it was probably a half mile from everybody. We crossed the creek, got back to our camp, cut off the ATV, and as soon as we cut off the ATV, we had a loud howl. It's one of the closest ones I've heard, except possibly one more, but me and Mark looked at each other, shrugged our shoulders and rolled over, and he went to his hammock. I got in my hammock, we went to sleep. About 2.30, I started smelling something that was rank. I was asleep and it woke me up. I was sniffing, trying to figure out what it was. I thought, I've been camping for three days. Is it me, is it my breath? <laughs> What is it? <laughs> but <laughs> is it my breath? Yeah, but it wasn't. I could hear something walk as I woke up. I could hear something walking away from the head end of my hammock, and I tried to turn. I had a thermal, I had a pistol, and I had a light all across my lap in the hammock. And I tried to turn with the thermal to get it on thermal and I couldn't turn enough at the angle it was to get it on thermal. So I laid there and held the thermal up over my head, pointing it behind me and just scanned it over my head, trying to pick something up. It probably walked 50 yards from us and stopped whenever I started moving. And you could tell it was bipedal and all that, but I just, took the thermal back down and laid there still. And after a few minutes, I heard it walk off toward the creek and away from us. The next day I told Mark about it and we reviewed, well, Mark or Shelley reviewed the audio later. And you could hear for 30 minutes prior to me waking up, the thing would throw rocks. You could hear it ping off the ATV. You could hear it hit close to me and you could hear the feet shuffle a little bit and it would stop and you wouldn't hear nothing for a little while and it would throw more stuff in to see what it was going to take to wake me up and I don't know how close the thing was whenever I finally smelt it but it had to be within 20 yards of me whenever I finally woke up because when it took off walking it was close and believe it or not Mark didn't wake up through it. He was over there about 20 or 30 yards from me. He didn't know about it till the next morning. <clears throat> I didn't jump up and run over there and wake him up. I just went back to sleep and about four in the morning, something else coming to camp, but I got it on thermal and it was just a raccoon or an armadillo, but it sounded totally different. But you were worried, weren't you? No. Well, you were thinking. I was thinking but I wasn't worried. Yeah. It affected me worse later after I thought about it, how close I was to yeah. whatever it was yeah. than it did that night. And then I started putting my hammock up in the middle of everybody instead of on the outside of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right, we're between stories right here, and I just want to mention a couple of little things real briefly. First, you know, we have another podcast called the What If It's True podcast. Everything on Dixie Cryptid is being transferred over to the What If It's True podcast. Plus, that podcast has its own stories, too, so it's like double the content. You can find it on YouTube. I'll put a link in the description for the YouTube channel, but it's also blasted out on the podcast network. And you can also listen to it at my website at DixieCrypted.com. So wherever you get podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Audible, iHeart, wherever you listen to podcasts, it saves a lot of data, a lot of battery on your phone. You can download the podcast and listen to them anytime you want. And they're usually longer than these Dixie Cryptid podcasts because on the Dixie Cryptid stuff, I lump them all together. I'll do two or three Dixie podcasts into one podcast on the uh, What If It's True podcast. So it's good for truckers and people who uh, don't want to use a lot of data or battery life. The second thing I wanted to tell you, we got a t-shirt shop. Christmas is coming up. There's a link in the description. We've got some really cool t-shirts out there. And it's also, you can see some of the images below the video right here. Just scroll up just a little bit and you'll see some images of our t-shirts. Check it out. They're not expensive. They're great stocking stuffers. Be great Christmas gifts. Start thinking about that. But I want to let you know that. All right, let's jump back into the video. Here's a story from James. Here's what James writes. I'm a 68-year-old resident of central Indiana, where following a 35-year career, I retired as a captain of detectives. I've always had a passion for being in the woods. As early as the age 12, I had a trap line. I loved doing it, and I was good at it, so I spent every free minute in the woods, especially in the late fall and winter. At various times over the years, the price of furs was high, and that was an added incentive. Every morning I'd leave my house at 4 a.m., walk one mile to the large wooded acreage where I'd trap and run my lines. Sometimes I had more than I could carry in my pack, so I'd have to retrieve the rest after school. In all my years in the police force, I've heard it all from every angle, but I can't say that I ever saw a Bigfoot. Back when I was a kid, Bigfoot wasn't even a thought in my head. However, I have heard and seen some very strange things in the woods that cannot be explained. There were many times in the woods when I had the uncanny feeling of being watched in the darkness. I would hear trees crashing too often to be at random occurrences, and I remember one early weekend morning in particular when I was looking for a new trapping area adjacent to where my other traps were set and a hard rain the week before had flooded the bottomland near the large creek. Afterwards, a deep freeze left pockets of water trapped after the creek receded back into its bank and covered in four-inch thick sheets of crystal clear ice that were like window panes into the many aquatic ecosystems below. As I passed over one of these frozen ponds, I looked down and I saw two large snapping turtles trapped under the ice in suspended animation. Turtle meat was excellent. My father taught me the art of cleaning a snapping turtle. It can be a difficult task if it isn't done right. So I decided to take these two turtles home for some good eating. I tried stomping the ice with my boot heel, but I couldn't even crack it. I decided that I'd bring a hatchet with me to chop them out when I came back the next day and went on my way. I made a three-mile circle around the area looking for fur sign and new places to set my traps. The ground was frozen hard. A couple hours later, as I came back around the little frozen pool with the turtles, I couldn't believe my eyes. Laying on the root ball of a tree were the two turtles. The ice had been smashed. That's how I know it was four inches thick. I could see how thick the chunks were. The turtles had been ripped open from the bottoms to the tops of their shells and all the flesh was completely gone. I couldn't imagine what could have had the strength to just rip those turtles open like that. Well, that night it snowed again. The following morning, I went back to the downed tree. That hard frozen root ball was completely destroyed with the root and root strewn all around in the snow. 
I looked around and found huge tracks leading to a part of the creek that ran too fast to freeze, and then they disappeared into the water. After all these years, I still think about those two turtles and the tracks that led into the creek. I have no earthly explanation for what it was, but I hope if you share this story, someone else may have had an encounter similar in relation to Bigfoot, and it will confirm what I think I already know. Well, if anybody's uh, had an encounter or seen some kind of evidence that's similar to what James described, Light us up in the comments. We'd love to know. I would say, you know, I mean, Bigfoot's supposed to be the strongest creature on earth, pretty much, you know, for his size and ripping turtle shells in half, I guess wouldn't be a big deal for him. That's a real interesting story. Four inches of ice and the it's broken and I don't, I don't know. It's just, just really cool stuff. Thanks, James, for the story. Let's move on to another one. I know what'll happen if there's one thing that I don't mention or add it, it'll be like, Oh, he's lying. <laughs> I was with a friend of mine and um, we were coon hunting, and I was new to it. He'd been taking me coon hunting some. We were uh, down in Jackson County, Indiana, and we were kind of we were down in the river bottoms, we were very close to the river actually, but we we're kind of in between two towns. We were between a town called Valonia and a uh, town called Medora, Indiana. So we run the dogs and they were way out ahead of us and we were still up by the gravel road. We went, took off down toward the dogs. They were carrying on pretty good. We got down there where they were carrying on and we come up to this ravine. And these, this ravine is not where the river flows. It only flows like through there when the river gets out. And it kind of cuts new channels and stuff, you know, over the years. And then when the river flows out of them, they grow up and they, they grow up with a lot of junk in them and vines and bushes. I'm not even, but e either way, this ravine we come up on is pretty deep. I estimating 10, 12 feet deep. It was pretty deep or wash out or whatever you want to call it. The dogs was carrying on pretty good and it was going on for a while. And they were down in all this thick stuff. Every once in a while, they, come by and we have these big coon lights and it's the old style coon lights where you had like the metal hat and it had the headlight on it kind of like a coal miners type hat yep. and we had those big old battery packs on your side it always pulled your pants down and killed your hip you old know school oh yeah old school so we were getting kind of bored with it and there's a tree growing up like right there beside the drop off and it's real muddy and i'm just leaning up against that tree and my buddy tim is to my left He's a little ways away from me, but not that far. We got our lights and we're shining in this ravine, you know. It's grown up real thick. You literally can't even see the dogs. You hear the dogs down in there. We kind of just hanging out and one of the dogs got to sounding a little bit different. And keep in mind, I'm new at this. I, I don't, there's, they had, have different tones, different sounds, and they tree a coon, and I'm not that familiar with it, but it sounded different. Yeah. Caught me a little bit off guard, and I thought, oh, maybe something's going on. We're both shining in the ravine still. We have hand, the handheld lights. All of a sudden, I see this dog come through the air. And when I say come through the air, keep in mind, this ravine is, I'm estimating, 10, 12 feet deep. And it's really wide. You can't jump across the ravine. Carl Lewis can't jump across that ravine. Couldn't do it. A dog cannot jump across that ravine. It's too wide. This dog comes through the air not in an upward angle or coming down or anything, comes across straight and it's like it happened in slow motion. And this dog has kind of got this, it's, kind of, it's not in balance, like a dog jumps out of a ditch. But it hits and it tumbles a little bit only because it didn't really fall, it just came straight across. I was just frozen in time and my eyes was huge, I'm sure, and I look at Tim Cause he's the experienced guy. Well, not really. He was only 16 too. But and we're looking at each other and putting lights in each other's face, and his eyes are real big around. He's puzzled by what he sees. The first thing I said was, "What was that? Why? Why did that? Yeah. What? You know, I, I. It's even hard for me to explain. It's like the dog. You know, your first reaction was somebody threw the dog. Well, yeah, somebody did throw the dog." But this dog is like 40 pounds, 50 pounds. Yeah, yeah I, again, I'm guessing. You can't throw the dog that straight. No. You can't do it. 
the dog came across there like that, I kept saying, what, what was that? What, you know? And he, he instantly just kind of accepted it like it wasn't nothing. He just said, well, it just jumped up out of there. That dog didn't jump up out of there. Yeah. That dog would have landed on its feet had it jumped out of there. So that was uh, the end of that. All we, we headed back, the, tr the dog just kept going. It was back on its feet and it kept going. The whole time we're walking that field, I just keep, it's like I'm almost walking backwards because I'm wondering what that is. Is that gonna come and throw me? Yeah. <laughs> I keep asking him, I'm like, dude, you seen what I seen, what was that? Well, I don't, you know. He just rejected it mentally right away, but I didn't forget it. So, was the dog yelping or anything? The only thing it did was they were yapping when they're down in there doing their thing, and the one dog started to sound different, kind of like it was, like it was stressed really bad or something, like something was going on. You know, something was different. Yeah. And it seemed it was just the one dog, but there was two dogs down there. It didn't take him long though. We was we was headed out. We were not far behind behind the dog. It was headed to the truck the best I could tell, but when we got to the truck, the dog was at the truck. What about the other the dogs? The other one, they just it came, it came, came right to, right came right up. He was yelling and it come right up, right up back up behind us. We this, actually beat it to the truck. I asked you this before, but you didn't put this together. You didn't even no. connect this with anything Bigfoot related. No. A long time. Right? No, just, just puzzled by what could have done that. Yeah. That was it, you know, short of Bigfoot, reading a few books when I was a kid. And That's awesome. Stuff like that. Because most times these stories you hear, they kill the dog. Yeah. Or yeah. the dog is so scared, you know, and these coon dogs are mean. They attack, they want to kill those coons. But this yeah, dog didn't run or anything. Looked like maybe it just got snatched up and thrown. I've beats me. Here's an email from Jason. Here's what Jason writes. I started bow hunting when I was 16. We own and hunt 50 acres of woods in northeastern Indiana. It's one of the largest parcels in the area and has provided us with some nice deer over the years. I'm 47 and I'm now an experienced hunter, but at 16 I was still pretty green. I knew the deer that came into my woods traveled back and forth to the woods three quarters of a mile to our west. So one day during the summer, I decided to secretly trespass onto the land to look for any signs of what and where they may be. This was not done for the intent to poach, only to learn what might be there and eventually make its way over to my woods. I only had a canteen and a hunting knife with me, but it was a short trip and the scouting didn't take long. As I made my way to leave, I came to a creek that divides the woods in half and began looking for a dry place to cross. And as I did so, I suddenly became aware of what I can only describe as a low moan that grew louder and louder. It grew so loud on one continuous note that I could feel it vibrating in my chest. It went on for what seemed like minutes, although I'm sure it wasn't. And then it abruptly and instantly stopped at the height of its crescendo. I immediately leapt into the creek, crossed and sprinted with all I had out into the bean field that bordered the woods. And at some point, my field knife found its way into my hand, but I have no memory of drawing it. I told my parents about it. And they said it was probably the landowner trying to scare me off and teach me a lesson. Well, the following Monday morning, Dad was taking me and my brother to school when we decided to stop at the local Greasy Spoon for breakfast. My dad got to talking to the local farmers, as was the custom, and inevitably, my incident was brought up. I remember it very clearly. One of the farmers looked at me and said, Well, what do you think it was? Well, I said, Probably just the landowner trying to scare me off. And you think he can scream loud enough to vibrate your chest, the man said. Well, I shrugged my shoulders and then asked, well, what do you think it was? He half smiled and he said, probably the same damn things the farmers see jump out of their fields every year during the harvest. Well, what do you mean, I asked. With all the concern of a man discussing the weather, he said, 
Oh, they'll be harvesting crops, mostly at night. When they get to the end of the row, those damn hairy wild men will jump out and run to the closest woods or fence row. The conversation quickly turned after that. My dad could tell I was freaked out. And on the way to school, he said, you know he was just teasing with you, right? There's no hairy men running around the woods screaming at people. Well, I know my dad meant well, but at 16 years old, I was far from convinced. In the last few years, I've introduced my children to bow hunting. They've taken to it like fish to water. My daughter got her first deer when she was only 13. My 10-year-old son quickly joined the ranks when he was only 8. Last deer season, I was up at 3.30 a.m. getting ready to sneak out the back to my stand. I like to be in it at least an hour before sunrise. I walked a mile and a half in the dark, moving as quietly as possible the whole way so it was not to be heard. It's quite a workout to carry my bow and all my gear all the way down there. Well, I got up to my stand. I was all settled in and was about to take my usual nap. I just started to doze off when I was hit with an overwhelming sense of dread and panic. I've had only two panic attacks in my life. Both times, I knew what was causing them, and I was able to get them under control. But this was something completely different. I was overcome with a mind-numbing sense of urgency to get out of the tree stand and run as fast as I could. I pulled my knife, then I grabbed my flashlight, but it didn't turn on. My eyes frantically searched in the darkness for any explanation for what I was feeling. I then realized this sense of panic had a direction. That's the best way I can explain it. I could feel where it was coming from. Again, my mind was flooded with the overwhelming desire to climb down and run as fast as I could. It was at this point, on the faint but very recognizable voice of the Holy Spirit, intervened and told me very clearly to stay. I sat there and I tried to calm my mind and focus on what I was being told. Again, that clear, small voice said, Don't get down, just stay where you are. So I stayed. I immediately sent a text to my wife and I told her what was happening. I asked her to pray for me, and I began praying too. And I prayed nonstop for 30 minutes. And suddenly, it went away. The feeling subsided, and the panic was gone, and I was utterly exhausted. A few minutes later, the sun crested the horizon to my back, and I had a clear view of the woods from my tree stand 20 feet up. and There was nothing there. During the time I was there, I heard absolutely nothing. No birds, no animals moving about, no crickets, no wind, nothing. My woods are located a half a mile from a main highway. Normally, I would hear the occasional vehicle driving by, but not on that day. I remember looking in that direction and seeing cars and semis, but I couldn't hear them. I could hear the rustle of my clothing when I moved, but that was it. Any good hunter will tell you that we hunt by sound as much as sight. Almost every deer I've ever killed I heard before I saw it. Not to hear anything that day only served to intensify my panic. I sat and hunted until noon before I finally decided it was time to go in. My wife would later tell me I wore an expression she'd never seen before when I arrived home. She said I looked like a frightened or confused child. That was definitely a blow to the mighty hunter ego that I was going for. She gave me time to change clothes and relax a little bit before she started asking questions. Well, I'm a big fan of Occam's Rager, which states entities should not be multiplied beyond necessity, or more plainly, the simplest answer is usually the correct one. We ran through all the simplest answers before moving on to the not-so-simple answers, and they left us more confused than when we'd started. On Sunday, I spent the entire day researching. I wanted to see if anyone else had experienced this. At first, it was a rabbit hole with no logical progression, but after a while, some common threads started to weave together, namely the idea of infrasound. 
Over the next week, I convinced myself I had dozed off and had some kind of nightmare, but I continued to research just the same. I learned that some predators, lions for example, use infrasound to instill confusion and panic into their prey to make them easier to catch. Have you ever watched one of those safari documentaries where a lion hunts a zebra or a gazelle? A lot of times the rest of the herd will take off running when the lion charges, but the one he gets hesitates for some reason. It stays still, looks confused or disoriented. Well, that's infrasound. I can't hear it, but we can feel and experience the effects of it very easily. The U.S. military has been experimenting with it for years. Well, I began finding theories on another creature in North America that is believed to use infrasound. The next weekend, when my daughter and I went out to hunt early, any doubts I had would vanish, and she witnessed it all. By the following Saturday, I had done my best to put it out of my mind altogether. My son was feeling ill, but my daughter and I had gotten up early and stalked back to the same location. She got into her stand, and I got into mine. We were about 15 yards away from each other. 30 minutes into our hunt, it was still dark, but the moon was full, so we could easily see 20 yards in front of us to a small clearing. It was a major deer run where we knew we'd most likely be shooting come first light. Well, as we sat there, we clearly heard something approaching from the south. It's not unusual to have deer meander by in the dark, especially when they're some 20 feet below. I assumed that's what we were hearing until I realized it sounded bipedal. Every year, poachers try to sneak onto our property and kill a deer or a raccoon, and then they leave before sunup. I immediately thought this must be a deer poacher then. With my 500 lumen light in hand, I prepared to let this guy walk into the small clearing in front of us where I planned to blind him and tell him to leave. It would be easy to spot him in the moonlight. The heavy footsteps crunched through the leaves, slowly moving away to the northwest, but I could see nothing. I was looking exactly at the spot where the sound of the steps was coming from, It was only 12 yards from my stand, but there was nothing there. My daughter would later state the same thing. When the steps were 15 yards directly due west of me, I still couldn't see anything. The moon was full and extremely bright. I could clearly see the outline of my daughter in her stand, but I could not see what was making the sound of the footsteps in the leaves. We later learned that we both wanted to text each other at that moment, but we were both afraid that it would give us away. When the sun finally lit up the sky, I looked over at my daughter. She pointed at her phone for permission to text, and I gave her the thumbs up. Her text said, can we go? I'm scared. Well, I wrote back, let's wait until the sun is completely up and we can see everything. What was that thing? Did you see it? She texted back, I don't know what it was, but it was huge. Can you see if mom will come get us? I don't want to sit here anymore. I told her to just sit tight and wait until it was really bright. We would be less of an easy target if that thing turned hostile. An hour past sunrise, we climbed down and we hightailed it back home. There is a theory that Sasquatch can cloak. It has been postulated that certain types of translucent hair follicles will bend light when vibrated properly by infrasound. Perhaps this explains why we could hear it, but we couldn't see it. And if Sasquatch is real, and I believe they are a diluted offspring of the Nephilim, the Bible clearly shows that the Nephilim returned after the flood. I think they are a polluted bloodline of these beings. That would explain why some of them have supernatural abilities, great speed, incredible strength, infrasound, the ability to cloak. I believe the Sasquatch Genome Project lends some credence to this. With the Sasquatch Genome Project, it turns out we have dozens of samples of hair and blood DNA that comes back as human female, unknown male. 
What does the Bible say about the Nephilim? They're the product of when demons laid with the daughters of men. Female DNA, unknown male DNA. Well, I know that sounds crazy, but I have a heavy background in science and research. I have a master's degree and two bachelor's degrees and an associate's degree in business. But strangely enough, this makes the most sense scientifically. Oftentimes, we Christians relegate Bible things to the Bible. It never enters our minds that they can and do still exist. Where in the Bible does it say that the Nephilim were completely destroyed for the second time? Well, it doesn't. We are only told that they were killed off once and then returned. I also believe this is why prayer seems to work. Both times when I prayed, the thing left. At any rate, this is my story. The following day, we went back to that location and we found dozens of nuts placed 10 to 12 feet up in a multiple Y branches along our access trail to our stands. Well, I grew up in those woods and I've been playing in them for 40 years and I have never seen that. I took pictures for reference and I realized they proved nothing, but it was an extremely odd event. And that's the end of his email. And that's very interesting. That's a uh, guy's lived on this property for all those years and he gets this infrasound experience or what he thinks is an infrasound experience. I don't really know what that is. I don't, is it like a vibration or something that a animal puts off or I don't, I guess I'd need to read up on infrasound, but the Nephilim thing, I don't know. There's a lot of people say that's the truth. Matter of fact, there's a huge amount of people that believe Bigfoot is the Nephilim. And then there's a, <laughs> an equal amount of people who think that it's not. The story is what's interesting and in how this man was compelled to do some digging and figure and think all this stuff out. And I guess that's what it does to you. I don't know. One of these experiences puts you on a quest to figure out what you were dealing with. Maybe it's the human condition. But I love the story, Jason. Thank you for sending it. It's a really good, well-written story. It's perfect for this channel. And you were very nice to spend the time to send this to me. So thank you, sir. Thanks for listening to the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. And we'll see you guys on the next one. Have a good weekend. Thanks.